Thank you, Kara. Um, I promise, Very I'm short start start. List, and it's after dinner, everything I say is really easy to digest. <laughs> <laughs> and I know it's between you and sleep, maybe it's boring, I don't know. <laughs> but okay. Um, so I, I want to tell you about um, x-ray science at ultra high intensity. And I want to tell you about this. Um, Like everybody at the end of the day. Uh, because, yeah, yeah. you know, there are a bunch of new um, light sources that operate in the X-ray machine that have uh, a trillion times the light intensity than those that have previously been around. And so it's really quite a different regime than we've been hearing about for the entire day. <laughs> so, so, you know, it, it's something different for you to think about. I have a feeling that probably no one in this room thinks about this except for me. But okay, you know, I'm an experimentalist, you're, you're here, you're supposed to talk to me because you're all there, so you're going to tell me what, you know, how, how to think about things and how to do things. Okay, so, but I, I, I'm, oops, I'm from Argonne. What's happening here? Okay, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to go through all this. And when I showed it on, on my slide, it, uh, uh, it of course just appears all the way. But I'm, go back, oops. go back, go back, go back. <laughs> No, 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 no. Okay. <laughs> but I'm from Argonne, and there are two big Argonne National Labs outside Chicago, and there are two big things at Argonne. One of the big things at Argonne is that they have a synchrotron light source, an X-ray light source, that um, feeds about 100 experiments simultaneously. It was previously the brightest X-ray light source around before this. Yeah. And a dominant theme at this light source is structural biology and X-rays. And to me, it's totally amazing how much x-rays have contributed to structural biology over the years. You may not realize this, but, well, you would if you were at Argonne and, and heard about x-rays every day of your life. But <laughs> the, very, the very first Nobel Prize was awarded to uh, um, uh, William Rentgen, and he did structural biology. He took this photograph of his wife's hand with a ring on it in 1895, and six years later, he was awarded the very first Nobel Prize. And then shortly thereafter, 14, 15 years later, Max von Laue made first discovery of the fraction by x-rays, and it was followed by Bragg's determining his crystal structure and, you know, the famous Bragg equation, right? So these are all these different things. What you may not realize is that all these other things on this list are also almost all Nobel Prizes in biology or chemistry, all, all using x-rays to determine 3D structures with very complex systems. You know, they might have three million atoms, and they actually know <laughs> where each of these atoms is to within, you know, a few angstroms by doing x-ray crystallography. And that is, is just a huge thing, and it takes up some fair fraction of the synchrotron ring at our now, it turns out to celebrate this, <laughs> in 2014, there was an uh, International Year of Crystallography. And this was put out by Pierre's nemesis, this was put out by Nature magazine. <laughs> so, but it's a very nice thing. And it, 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 it has a milestone timeline of all the different things that are contributing to crystallography. The very last thing on this list, <laughs> interestingly enough, is the X-ray for electron laser. And the milestone that they put on for the X-ray for electron laser was this here. Um, and this milestone 25, seeing in a flash. And this, this, this little picture has to do with um, this very large collaboration headed by Janusz Wojdu um, at the uh, University of Uppsala, where he wanted to make a 3D image of something that wasn't a crystal. It was just, this turned out to be um, a mini virus. And, and that's what they think is the next step because the big bottleneck in all these crystallography things is actually making a good enough crystal to diffract from. And so if you can get away from that necessity, it's a big thing. So, you know, this is, this is what they think. Now, this is actually how you do that, right? This is the poster child experiment that was, uh, uh, that's been bandied about for some time. And, and the idea is you take this big molecule and you drop it into this very intense x-ray beam. 
And scattering from this big molecule is captured, you know, both in wide angle and in small angle. And from capturing all, all of the, the photons, you know, from that, you can then come back and reconstruct the 3D structure. That, that's kind of the dream. Um, for, for an AMO experimentalist, there might be like one or two in the room. <laughs> for an AMO experimentalist, they might think, oh, this is just like the experiment I do in my lab, right? I may not take a big protein molecule, but I would take maybe a smaller molecule and I'd subject it to some laser, maybe it's not x-ray, some laser, and then we'd catch all the fragments and figure out what's going on. So, in fact, of course, there's, there's a lot going on if you take a trillion photons and focus it down onto this molecule that might only be you know, a few nanometers in, in diameter. And so from an AMO perspective, there are these pretty interesting questions, right? So this was the simulation by Jan Schwedi's group that got everyone excited back in the year 2000. And this is uh, the very famous attraction pattern. And he, he um, simulated what would happen if you took those x-rays and blasted it onto a lysosine molecule with this type of intensity, 3 times 10 to the 12 x-rays, focused down to a 100 nanometer spot um, at 12 poles, which would give you something <coughs> on the order of 10 to the 22 watts per square centimeter. Like, this is a huge number, right? I mean, we listened to Lars, and he was saying, okay, 10 to 14, 10 to 14, but this is just a big number, right? So, so it's interesting, not only for, for the biologists, but it's also interesting for AMO folks. And so one would like to understand, you know, so this is during the pulse, before the pulse hits, it, it looks intact, and then during the pulse, it, it, you know, start, it's pretty much intact for 10 minutes. But after 50 minutes seconds, things are still on exploding, going all over the place. So, you know, from our perspective, it would be interesting to understand this Coulomb explosion. And of course, um, prior to the Coulomb explosion, the electrons are running around all over the place inside this molecule. And the electrons are the thing that are actually scattering the x-rays. So that whole pattern is determined by where all the electrons are in this big soup. And so, you know, it's also of interest for us to know that. And so we spent a lot of time on atoms just figuring out what was going on with that. And also the behavior at, you know, this, this, this very high intensity. There are other interesting questions that I won't get into in this talk, but so much in this talk, but, but later. So, of course, you know, so, so these things are big. They're accelerated based. They cost on the order of a billion dollars. I'll show you a little later. But of course, you don't do it just because of biology, right? So there was a whole science case made, the LCMS first experiments, uh, from atomic collision and optical physics, you know, all the way down to um, uh, soft X-ray material science and materials in extreme conditions. But from, you know, the thing that, that the AMO community wanted to do was basically to understand and control, you know, X-ray atom molecule interactions at these very tiny places. And th these, we would hope, would be a foundation for other applications, and also to provide diagnostics for, for the LCLS. Now, it also turns out that the LCLS was quite successful, I, you know, when it first came up. And <coughs> these X-ray free electron lasers, they're really proliferating. This, uh, this table comes more or less from a new review of a uh, modern physics article that talks about the first five years at LCLS. And what you can see here is that here's the LCLS, and it was really the first one operating in the hard X-ray range. But and the other one that's operating presently is this one in Japan, uh, SACO, which also operates in the hard X-ray range. And then there are these softer X-ray uh, um, facilities in Germany with Flash. But, but what I want to say is that the, the x valve output uh, stands a very large photon energy range, and its focus intensity gets you know, quite large. But if you look over here, this is when, when these new things are coming up. They're coming up in the next couple of years. You know, there are 15 different instruments <coughs> coming up, which is going to vastly multiply um, the opportunities to, to do things. And so this is just to try to make a little bit of connection back to what you've been listening to for the rest of the day. And this is actually from a review article that, that Margaret wrote in Science just of this year. And it compares you know, these accelerator-based sources with the laser-based HHG. And over here on this side are uh, the accelerator-based sources. You know, these are big things. These are billion-dollar things, right? <laughs> 
and then over on, and, and what it shows as a function of time, and this is the X-ray brilliance, which, which you know, for people, it's it's a quantity that everyone uses. It's the photons per second per 10 percent bandwidth per millimeter squared per milliradian squared, and you can see it's going up exponentially. And this is the jump from the synchrotrons up to the FELs. Turns out, and, you know, this this shows maybe a uh, full order magnitude jump. But in fact, if you pack, if you plot a peak brilliance rather than average brilliance, this jump would be nine orders of magnitude. I mean, it's huge. So and over this, on this is this, side, Linda, is this the Moore's law for X-ray radiation? Pardon me? Is this the Moore's law for X-ray radiation? <laughs> yes, yes, yes. You know, it's it's very interesting. I have a slide which I'm right is not in this deck, but it compares Moore's law to X-ray brightness, no. and of course X-ray brightness wins by a lot. <laughs> um, and over here, you know, we have the laser-based HHG, which can get way down into these very, very fast, uh -huh. you know, well, I have one more question. Yeah, yeah. Is it getting cheaper? Is it getting cheaper? <laughs> 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 well, well, okay, okay, let, let me say one thing. I will say that um, the people who are coming later, I was just recently in Switzerland, they are building a Swiss bell. Theirs is significantly cheaper because they figured out ways to make things a little bit more compact than right. otherwise. And of course, it's made with Swiss precision, right? So, 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 so you know, people do learn from from what has been done. Before. So, but it's not quite a, it's it's not quite like you know computing power in your iPhone. But they don't get smaller. Okay. Um, but uh, you know, and, and the high harmonic phase sources are less expensive than a billion dollars. Is that right, Margaret? Yes, less. <laughs> and much more convenient, you go to much faster time scales, but they don't quite produce the amount of X-rays per pulse per bandwidth to, to do some of these uh, things that, that uh, these, these sources do. So, so what, you know, for this particular conference, it's like, okay, this these, these is ultra-strong radiation at ultra-short wavelengths, and, and so that's kind of what what we're doing here. Okay, and so just, this is, this, this is you've seen it many times already before, but, um, you know, at, at these long wavelengths, you have these uh, laser-driven processes that can be described by classical uh, trajectories after it's been released, and we've heard all about it. But what, what I want to say is, now, now here, at the, at the LCLS, at these, at these X-ray wavelengths, you have huge powers, like 100 petawatts per square centimeter. But, but the Palmer mode of energy, this energy in the field, and you know, this displacement is nicely shown by one of Paul's <laughs> um, graphics, is, is really small compared to what you have in the optical regime. But it's, it's, just, it's just very, very different, right? So there, are no, there aren't really any field-driven processes that are happening. And so then, <laughs> then I thought, oh, well, what about, you know, this Keldish brown that everyone is talking about? Okay, so this is this picture that we, we heard this beautiful lecture by Lars about, right? And so the tunneling time of the laser period is this Keldish parameter, and you can calculate it by, you know, known quantities of the field that you're putting on and the properties of, of, your, of your system. And um, if you can get this thing below one, then you have some good chance of tunneling in the very naive, whatever, experimentalist perspective. And so, you know, when you have x-rays, well, you're over many ionization potentials, right? So you just directly ionize. And I already told you that you hardly have any, you know, any field-driven processes. But, but it's kind of interesting, actually. If you look at hydrogen, when you look at a one micron laser, and you have your 10 to the 15 miles per square centimeter, you get this, you know, lowish Keldish parameter. But if you just scale up by, you know, a factor of 10, and you look at hydrogenic neon, and then, you know, it has an ionization potential of about 1,000 EV. And you go with, like, you know, 100 EV photon. And it's also at 10 photon plasmas. It's a very similar thing, actually. And then, you know, at 10 to the 21, remember I was telling you about 10 to the 22 before, now you're getting into the same bizarro regime. And maybe this doesn't work. I mean, Lars would have to tell me does it work. But, yeah. is it, well, it's not as if you have hydrogenic neon sitting around to play with either. So, you know, but, but I will tell you that you will see that we can produce hydrogenic neon. So, so what's going on with the x valve? Right? What's going on is that basically they can saturate single-source on absorption. 
Um, and so it, a typical synchrotron pulse, you know, if, that you use around the ring, might have off that, that might have about 10 to the 6 photons, and you might focus it down to you know square micron or so. And for our guy at 6 kV, you have sort of this cross section. So you know the probability of, of, of absorption is cross section times influence, and that's on the order of 10 to the minus 6. So it's a very small probability. But you know in the X wells, you have 10 to the 12 photons can easily be focused down to high. So you can easily saturate that. And so you can define you know, a saturation parameter for the fluids where you know, all these things are going to happen. And you can actually describe what's going on in, in, in an atom with a rate equation model where you simply calculate what these cross sections are for all these different processes and you track what's going on in each of the states. And so that turns out to work you know, very well. And so that's quite, quite simple. Now, the one photon processes have, have caused this proliferation of synchrotrons around the world. Like, it's not just an argon that you have a synchrotron. You have them everywhere because they're very useful. If you go to this um, website, lifesources.org, you, you, know, you can do a tour of all these different ones. Um, so let me just quickly tell you what's going on you know, in the one photon limit that, that caused these things to be so, so interesting. So fundamentally, there are a number of processes in this photon energy range between kilovolts and say 100 kilovolts. The dominant one, this is, this is um, a, a picture from carbon, the cross section for photoabsorption, which is this, this big thing, is completely dominant. There is a cross section for coherent scattering, which is elastic scattering, which is what's used for the crystallography. And then there's also, you know, for incoherent or, or Compton scattering, and then these other things that happen in the nucleus that are at much higher energies. But let's look, let's focus in on photoabsorption. And so photoabsorption, if you come out here at some particular energy, what you see is that you know if you get above the threshold, you can eject the 1s electron. But it's not as if you don't talk to the other guys at all. They're all there. You can actually dissect this photo, uh, photo absorption cross section into all the partial cross sections. And this was done way before synchrotrons. It's done with like an X-ray tube and you know photoelectron spectroscopy because of course for each one of these shells you know exactly what the photon, what the electron energy should be. In the and. There are lots of details associated with this too, which, which, which people you know have, have discerned over the years. Because not only can you have photoabsorption, but you can have things where you know electron correlation can play a role, and then you can have not only a single 2s electron come out, but you can also do some excitation or or double ionization. So there are many things that that can actually happen when you hit, hit an X-ray onto an atom, and it turns out that you have one of the experts on all of this in the room, sitting in the front row here, because <laughs> Tony knows all. He's written a very long you know, um, review article on this many, many years ago. But if you need, if you need questions answered on it, he's your man. <laughs> um, so then what happens after photoabsorption? Um, well, there are two things. You create a hole down here. That hole can be refilled either by X-ray fluorescence or it can be refilled by OJ process. Uh, the two have sort of different selection rules and, and operators and, and um, you know, behave quite differently um, as a function of Z. But it's really, it's very well known. So in, at the low Z range, you know, K-shell OJ is, is the dominant process. When you get up to high Zs, fluorescence is dominating. You can find all of these energies, all of these fluorescent lines out there in, in the literature and on XCOM and <coughs> They're very easy to find, and people use them all the time. So what you what you can do with this is if you have these X-ray emission lines, they're very characteristic for elemental uh, identification. And so what you can do if you go back to this X-ray imaging is that you can take your X-rays and you can shine it onto your sample. You can rotate your sample around, and you can collect all of the X-rays that come out from there. And then what you can do is you know each each element lights up its own color. And so if you have a dispersive detector, you can tell exactly where each element is. And so this was a very nice demonstration done, done at Argon that shows the 3D elemental distribution in a dyad. So this thing was, um, I guess, 
uh, you know, a few microns in diameter, and they could do like 150 nanometer voxels. And you can see here, this I think is silicon, and then they have iron and magnesium. And you can really see how that thing was, was made. I, you know, I think it's quite, it's quite pretty, <laughs> actually. So how many, how many atoms do they have roughly in this sample? In this diam? Yeah. Uh, I couldn't tell you for sure. No, but roughly. But let's see, it's uh, three micron, it's probably 10 microns in diameter, so it might be a 10 micron sphere. And so if you have a 10 micron sphere and everything's, you know, you, you can calculate from that. <laughs> so if it's by an angstrom, right, that's 10 to the minus 10, right. 10 to the minus 6, 10 to the 4, 10 to the 12, I guess. Right. Do they do this with biological molecules too? Do they do this with biological? Well, I guess I could call this a, bio, a biological molecule. This is a diatom that's found in the sea, and they they fished it out, and you know. But, but it, I mean, ten to the, I, I believe you ten to the twelve. I mean, that's a lot of atoms, right? Oh yeah, yeah. I, I do one atom, and uh, <laughs> okay. and you have. How can you actually fight your way through all the information that you have in this diffraction? Oh, this this is not this is not infraction at all. All this is. Oh, it's just absorption. This is this is well, this is fluorescence, right? Oh, fluorescence. So you, shine, yeah. you shine your X-rays onto your sample. But even then, I mean, you have this huge amount of information coming out, right? Well, okay. So this is done at, at a synchrotron, and you have a dispersive X-ray detector here, so it can discriminate, you know, an X-ray that it sees from silicon from one that it sees from iron. So all you need is, you know, an energy detector that can distinguish all these different elemental X-rays. And so then you, you rotate it around like you do normally with tomography, and then you you can gather all your information. You attend to the 12 yeah. points? Yeah. Yeah. Well, you, you can see it at these 150 nanometer voxel ranges. Oh, I so see. in the 100 nan 150 oh. nanometer voxel, you will have, you know, some, some I number see. of so atoms, it's not, right? So, the so you don't see one atom. Right, okay. This is this is not atomic resolution, but it's still I'm you know, sorry, for, I'm for biology it's pretty interesting. I'm right? sorry. And so well, I mean I will say that you know this whole group that's doing this is really excited about the APS upgrade because the upgrade is going to increase the flux that they can put on this sample by about a factor of hundred. And so it took them a long time, it took them weeks to do this particular <laughs> demonstration. And so you know they're very excited about, about that. Okay, and so then, you know, there are all these X-ray spectroscopies. I'm not, I'm not going to explain them to you. Books have been written about it. But it turns out if you take the X-ray absorption spectrum, you can get a lot of information even on simple molecules, right? So you can get uh, distances to neighboring atoms if you have a central absorbing atom. From the near-edge structure, you can get the oxidation state, geometry, coordination environment, and, and so on and so forth. Because you know what this is, what this near-edge structure is doing is probing the first unoccupied levels in, in, your, in, your, mall, in your in your system. And of course, from photoelectron spectroscopy, you get energy levels of all kinds of things. This molecule is particularly, I think, this molecule is particularly cool. It's a chi bun molecule. And uh, so what you see is there are all these different carbons in this molecule. And you can see from the photoelectron spectrum that this carbon has, you know, with all these Fs on it, has you know, a chemical shift over here, where with all the H's is over here, they're very, very distinct. So you can really tell the difference, you know, from one atom to another. You can imagine, yeah, sorry, right, right, you could excite something over here, and maybe you could see what happened over on the I mean, <coughs> it's, it's a, just a very nice demonstration molecule. Okay, so now. <laughs> Ultra intense X-ray interactions with atoms, right? So I want to tell you a little bit about this Linux parent life source, and it's just because you know I was around when this first coming up, and so it was very interesting. So I can tell you these stories, and sometimes it's nice, and it's after dinner, <laughs> all this other kind of stuff. But okay, so this thing, um, this expel is was based on an idea of Claudio Pellegrini in 1992. He got the Warren's Award for this this year. Um, and it's really cool because they got to use the last uh, one kilometer of this existing three kilometer Linux. So put that you know high energy physics machine, which was a little bit uh, out of date, into good use. And it would take it would accelerate electrons up to roughly the speed of light, you know, 14 GeV. It would send it through an undulator hall, which is you know a periodic array of magnets about 100 meters long. 
And if you transport it, yeah, go back. Uh, to you know, the near experimental hall where we do experiments or the far experimental hall where, where, where other folks would be doing things. And uh, it was a collaboration of many, many labs. But it was so exciting when uh, this thing lays for the first time at one and a half angstrom back in, in 2009. And uh, I want to quote this from John Clyde because um, he, he was also the person who built the Argon EPS. <laughs> so then he went over <laughs> to, to Stanford and did this. And he goes, OK, in my life before Slack, I had the privilege to participate in various capacities in the design and construction commission with two Linux, two synchrotrons, four storage rings, three FPLs. And now I've had the privilege to be in Slack's main control room on April 10th when the Linux coherent light source became a 1.5 angstrom laser. I don't expect I will ever, as long as I live, see such a beautiful, smooth turn on of any light source. With each undulator placed on the beam path, the FPL power increased by a factor of 2.3. In two hours into the first attempt of blazing, the midpoint of FPL lights and 12 undulators was nearly 2,000 fold more intense than plain old undulator radiation. Team called it quits at 11 p.m. that night, and when they returned at 8 a.m. the next morning, the FPL light came back as soon as the shutter was open. And so you can see, you know, the difference before it was lazy when they put in enough refrigerators. I mean, he, he, was, he was very excited, and, and so he shows, oh, he even smiles sometimes. And so this is uh, John Delia, and this is uh, Paul Emma, who was sort of the master um, machine builder steerer. And uh, this is Jerome Wong, who's now sort of their head of accelerator operations. And they're all still there for LCLS2, which is great, <laughs> because they clearly don't have anything to work. Um, I just wanted to show you this because, uh, of course, from Argon, we're very proud that we actually made these, uh, all of these undulators. <laughs> and uh, you know, there are lots of undulators, and they're on ramps, and you can stick them in one at a time. And so you can watch as you start to stick in these undulators saturation um, of, of the lazy output. And it shows, you know, after about 60 meters that, that the whole thing is saturated. So you can just keep putting them in. And so it's kind of cool. Um, so what's actually coming out the end after you do all this? Well, it's not quite as pretty as the lasers that you probably have in your lab or are used to. But, you know, the electron bunch comes in. It goes through these undulators. Um, as, it, as it goes through, the electrons self-organize. and and then they have <coughs> an outcome you know, a, a, a self-amplified spontaneous emission pulse. This pulse is rather noisy, both in time and in spectrum. Um, but it has a lot of photons. Um, and typically, um, one has a bandwidth on the order of a half-ish percent or so coming out the end. And a duration that's tunable between, say, 10 and 100 like, seconds. And and very short spikes, um, but quite a bit of energy. Turns out you can tune this radiation um, if you change uh, the undulators as you would do with <coughs> any So I want to just tell you a little bit about our first experiment, because it's kind of cool um, how much you can learn from just doing something really simple. <laughs> and so we wanted to investigate the nature of electronic response, and we took you know, affluence of about 10 to the 5 x-rays per uh, squared angstrom. Turned out that on the, just the day before we started our experiment, um, that, uh, that Paul Emmett that I pointed out to you before, we had this little meeting, and there were like 20 of us in the room or so, and, and he said, hey, Linda, do you think, uh, would it be interesting to you if we could actually change the duration of the pulse? And I said, well, of course, right? How long will that take? He said, oh, maybe about 30 minutes. He said, how do you do that? He said, well, we just changed the bunch of compressors a bit. We have to do that, right? <laughs> you have to have all the knobs you can, especially when you're doing something very simple. Um, and so, so we were able to change pulse durations there. And then um, the initial energy range that was advertised was 8 to 2, 000, 800 to 2,000 EV. And we could get on this order of you know, power. But it's, it's kind of far from these original uh, specs of 10 to the but so our approach was to use a very simple atom, neon. Um, it had, you know, all the binding energies. I showed you all those other things that you know about it. We know that when you do inner shell excitation, you have an OJ yield on the order of 98%. Um, and that the OJ clock, the time that happens is on the order of 2.4 femtoseconds. 
So we figured, okay, we can go between 800 and 2,000 EB. All right, this is really good for neon. It has an edge at 870. That means we can probe the changes in interaction from the outer to inner shell back in 2007 in preparation. And there, were, there was a very nice you know, graph of what should happen as a function of photon energy. Um, and you know, you could pick out what would happen for these three target energies. This was done for the specs that they told us at the time. They didn't tell us that we could change the pulse duration, right? But you know, the more these things happen as, as you go. And so if you actually plot what's going on from, from the theory uh, in terms of you know, a visual as opposed to those lines, what you see is that at 800 dB, you're below the threshold. So the only thing that you can actually talk to are the valence electrons. And so you go... Could you just explain what the APB means? Ah, yes, <laughs> I can do that. <laughs> okay, B are valence electrons. P are photoionization electrons from inner shell. A is an OJ electron. <coughs> so, when, so when you're below the threshold for 1S excitation, the only thing you can talk to are about the outer electrons in, in your neon atom. But what you can do is because you have so much fluence and so much flux, you can like take off, off all of them, right? And then if you go to this intermediate energy, 1050, you can go through this sequence where you have first a photoionization, and then without doing anything, you have an OJ decay. So you get two charges for one, and then you go photoionization, OJ decay, so on and so forth. And then if you go to very high energies, 2000 EV, you're above the ionization thresholds for every single charge state of neon, and so you can strip everything. Um, so those were the three energies that we picked. And, and you know, actually, when you go to these, these uh, x-ray sources, you can't actually, it's not like going into your lab where you can go back and improve, right? You can't, you, have, you only have so much, you have it for five days, and that's like it. Okay, so that's all about charge states, but you might like to know how you got there. And so you can actually figure out how you got there by doing some electron spectroscopy. So at low intensities, you might imagine this scenario, where you first do a photoionization, then the OJ K happens, producing, taking one hole in the inner shell to produce two holes in the outer shell. Or, and then followed by another photoionization, this PAP. But at high intensities, you can imagine the situation where before the OJ decay happens, you've actually taken out another inner shell electron to form a hollow atom. And so, so then you can imagine the same, the same this other scenario. But it turns out that if you look at the OJ electron that goes into a double core hole state relative to one that goes into a single core state, they have very different energetics, so you can easily distinguish them. And so the actual apparatus that was used for this was, uh, is shown here. So we have a number of um, time of flight electron spectrometers that will give you angular distribution from which you can distinguish a photoelectron from an OJ electron. There's a little neon gallia and also an ion time of flight spectrometer. And you know, the x-rays would come in and we would be focused down to micron or so and we would just look at what happened in the Very simple. This was really put together by John Bozak and, and Christoph Costa of uh, the LCLA. So in day one, we had these really interesting observations, right? Well, the first thing we found out was that when you, when you have a single 100 frames per second x-ray pulse at that very high photon energy, you fully strip the neon. And so you can make hydrogenic neon, see? <laughs> um, and, uh, and it's a six photon, 10 electron process through this, you know, PA, PA, so on and so forth. The other thing we found out was, oh, well, you can actually change the pulse duration. And what we found out was that if you have shorter pulses with equal pulse energy and fluids, you suppress the absorption and the damage. Now this is really weird because usually, you know, if you have a shorter pulse, it's, it's much higher intensity. And usually that causes more damage, but not so in this case. And what we were doing is we were changing things between like 80 and 300 femtoseconds. And those are really weird numbers because I already told you that the OJ decay happened in like two femtoseconds. So we were we were quite confused. We did not know what was going on. But on the other hand, we also yeah. I'm just wondering what, what do you mean by damage? Well, by damage, what I mean is uh, more ionization. So damage. <coughs> so yes. <laughs> so if something is not in its original state, we consider it damaged. And so if you have more uh, higher, if you have a, an abundance of high charge states, then it's more damaged than if you have a more abundance. 
And so what we would see is with the longer pulse, the red, you have much more um, high charge states than with the shorter pulse at 80 femtoseconds, which is black. So we'd say, okay, we've got more damage. What are the, the tiny peaks? Um, there are isotopes. That, so, you know, I told you about the rate equation model. It actually works very well. And because you only have a limited amount of time, you just have to march through and do what you did. So we did our three energies, 800, 1,000, 50, and 2,000 EV, and found, you know, basically that the rate equation model worked reasonably well to explain what was going on. So I thought, okay, well, well, well this is good. I mean, but we, we really want to go back and understand what was going on with that pulse duration dependence. And so it always turns out that when you go back and think later, then things become more clear. And they even become obvious, but they weren't obvious at the time. And so what happens is that, you know, basically X-ray absorption is due to the presence of, at, at these energies at, of, of 1S level. We're out at 2,000 EV now. And then when, when you have high X-ray intensities, you eject those from 1S level. So there's no more absorption that's going to happen, right? And that explains in general what happens. But what about this weirdo time scale that um, we were talking about, 80 to whatever, 300 femtoseconds? Well, it turns out that the Auger rate changes dramatically when you go up to higher charge states because there just aren't as many you know, electrons out in the outer shells to actually do the OJ. So when you come out to like, you know, charge state seven or so, now the OJ rate, instead of being the couple femtoseconds, is now on the order of 30, 40 femtoseconds. So now you can actually see why changing the pulse duration between, you know, 80 and, two, and 300 actually makes some kind of difference. And it's because it takes a long time for those OJ electrons to fill back in to any type of hole such that you can actually, you know, continue on, on with your recycling and so we also want to um, use the electron spectrometers to track the ionization mechanisms. And in particular, it was very useful because you could really isolate how many double core holes that you could make. If you actually, you know, OJ electrons are isotropic, um, photoelectrons you have to have some direction that you, can, that, you can, that you know about. So if you go to a 90 degree um, geometry where the photoelectrons tend not, not to be coming so much, and you look at these, these high energy OJ electrons, you can actually find a very clean signature of a hollow atom production. And that's this double core hole OJ field you know, compared to the single core. And it turns out that the amount of, of this uh, OJ yield that you have is huge. So you are making like 10% of these, these hollow atoms compared to what you might see at a synchrotron, which is just due to electron correlation of less than 1%. And this is very, you know, it's, it's interesting because then it also gives you some um, measure of the nominal electron pulse duration because you can calculate what it should be. But then we we're kind of interested, well, okay, then, then what happens, you know, if you've made all these hollow atoms, what's that going to do to all this scattering and all, you know, this whole coherent diffractive imaging business, right? Is that going to do something bad? Turns out, not so bad. <laughs> Um, if you take a look at the ratio of the absorption to uh, the elastic scattering, say AKB, where you might actually want to do one of these things, turns out that for the normal situation, for the normal carbon, that, that ratio is 20, and for the hollow, it's, it's only 2. So, you know, it doesn't damage as much. And then if you actually do a calculation of the form factors and whatnot, the biological guys are really only interested in, in, thing, in resolutions to around 3 angstroms or so. And the actual decrease in the scattering out, out to that, you know, that Q is not that much, even if it's hollow. So, so it's not so bad. Uh, Linda, <clears throat> what precisely do you mean by uh, elastic scattering? Are you referring to Rayleigh scattering? Yeah, Rayleigh scattering. I see. Yeah. yeah, so, you know, then, so we, so that paper, you know, with, with saying kill on like, oh, well, you know, this, this could be bad. <laughs> and so that was sort of the start of the whole, uh, uh, package to just calculate what's going on, you know, with atoms in these fields. And so this, so this was actually published in Pierre's least favorite journal. <laughs> but, but I want to say it had a lot of, uh, we had a lot of collaborators um, on this because it wasn't, it certainly wasn't just us at, at Argo. 
Okay, so these are things, these are things that we learned. Um, that you know, the sequential single photon absorption that I showed you the picture of, that really dominates the interaction mechanisms. Uh, it turns out the direct two photon absorption is small, and we'll talk about it a little bit later. And this X-ray induced transparency has also been called frustrated absorption by Nora in her paper. But it's, it's really a general phenomenon. It's been seen in molecules. This is Nora's paper in clusters. This is one of Christoph's papers in solids, you know, by a whole bunch of people. And um, you know the implications of, for for imaging is you know, it's, it's not so bad. And also, of course, you know, AMO is always a good to guy to have a as a diagnostic of what's going on with your laser. <laughs> so you know what I want to say is it's a really it's a big team effort. It's not just the folks at Argonne, including Robin Zander, who at the time was there, you know, as a theorist. But it's also, you know, all these guys who are actually in the control room, who are running things, right? Because they don't really like you to go into their hutches. And so, because they know what's going on better than you, because you're only there for five days, right? <laughs> and then, <coughs> out of the, um, uh, you know, at the Accelerated Control Center, the MCC, the main control center, they're real heroes because, you know, you can't, the LCLS has fixed gap undulators, so you can't actually change the energy like you can at a synchrotron however much you want. You actually have to call them on the phone and tell them, change the energy to whatever, 800 dB. So then they have to change the electron energy in the entire linear to get you to change, for you to change your, you know, photon energy. So, you know, they, they were certainly yours. Okay, so now let's look at a few of these other weirdo things that, that AMO folks see. Love from from the So there's this, you know, what what's going on with this non-sequential double ionization? So at optical wavelengths, there's this very famous. Maybe this is not the right one because it's not really that good. But, but there's this very famous paper which shows precision measurement of strong field double ionization of helium, and it shows that for the double ionization of helium, there's this big non-sequential mean that you know at 10 to the 15 watts per square centimeter is like 10 to the six times greater than the sequential business that we've been talking about. So it's very natural to think, oh well wouldn't we shouldn't we be able to see some of this in the X-ray regime? And you know it, it's been so fruitful in the optical regime, <laughs> it's really there must be something good. <laughs> but it turns out that it's very, very hard to see. Um, and in fact, you know, of course we looked for it. You know, in the initial experiment, because you could have two, two 800 EV photons, right, clearly making, you know, <laughs> a, a, a double ionization, but um, that wasn't what happened. It was, you know, certainly swamped by everything. And so it was only seen by looking at helium like neon, in fact. And this was, you know, a paper um, by Gilles Dumis, who's now at Argon, uh, with uh, Lou DeMauro leading it. And so what you can see is that, you know, a signature of this nonlinear absorption is that you have um, a quadratic dependence of the yield as a function of the intensity. And so when you went below the threshold for production of this um, neon 9 plus, what you would see is that below, below threshold you could see this uh, quadratic dependence, whereas above threshold for production of neon plus would be linear. And it turns out that, of course, there's more than one way that you can actually come to it because it's pretty complex. <coughs> you can have the normal two photon um, uh, direct ionization if you start with neon A plus here. But you can also come in this other way where, where because the OJ lifetime of the, the neon 7 plus was so long, you, you stay in this excited state and you can ionize out from the excited state and get to the neon 9 plus. Also, so there are these two ways that actually contribute to this quadratic dependence. And the magnitude of this that, that was observed was uh, 10 to the 3 larger than predicted by perturbation theory. So this is a sign, right, that it's hard to see. <laughs> and uh, the value of this, uh, this two-photon cross-section was really enhanced because it was near, uh, uh, there was a resonance that was, was fairly nearby. And, you know, of course, this importance of hidden resonance should be emphasized to some degree because if you're changing, you know, if you're going from zero to 10 plus in 100 femtoseconds, there are resonances all over the place, right? And so what happens is that, you know, this high fluid pulse is altering the target, and there are these enormous hidden resonances which are way higher than the background. So here you can see resonances for 1 s to 2p and the 1 plus, 2 plus, and 3 plus, you know, so if you happen to sit your energy 
your photon energy on one of those, you can, you can do all kinds of damage. But what about something more complex than, than neon? Okay? So there's much more going on, right? So neon is pretty simple, right? You, you um, eject uh, uh, a 1s electron and you can have this nice OJ. But if you, for example, take xenon, you have 54 electrons. You eject a 2s electron. And then you have this huge cascade. And this cascade, so instead of just having you know, uh, one electron come off after, you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight more electrons. One photon, eight electrons, is really complicated. How are you going to deal with this? Well, it's a very, it's a computational challenge. The one that was solved by uh, St. Louis Lund and, and Robin Sandra at Cinco. And, but again, you can, you can use these, you know, simple, you know, cross-section perturbative models. What you see is that here, here's this pulse. It's an 85 per second pulse. It's got a lot of energy in it, um, 10, you know, more than 10 to the 12 in a, uh, a square micron. And here's the pulse. And so you start out, you have photoionization that causes all these oceans. And then eventually, when you get up to higher uh, charge states, you can start to have fluorescence because it, it comes into play. But you know, if you can saturate out, then you can get all the way up to um, the xenon 44 plus with, with this um, one thing. But the total number of electron configurations is huge, and so the Monte Carlo technique was, was used to, to do that. So that was followed by an experiment at SACLA, um, done by Kiyoshi Yui and his group. And here, the x-rays from SACLA were 5.5 kV. But instead of having you know, such a huge fluid, they had slightly smaller fluids. Um, and so they couldn't actually saturate all the way out. But they still got out to like you know, 25 or so charge states. So it's it, you know, all in one pulse. You can see what happens, photoionization followed by other shades and so on and so forth. Now, if you take xenon, instead of looking up at 5 kV, when you come down to 2 kV, you can also see uh, many things that, that will happen. <coughs> so you can still crack open this M shell, and what you can see is that you can have, you know, single photon, two photon, three, four, five, six photon absorptions. This gets you all the way up to 28 plus. This slope gives you the number of photons apart, and all this happens in, you know, a few seconds. What I want to show you is that this whole creation in xenon. It's on the same time scale, and all these OJ decays are on the same time scale as the XFL pulse. So you create this green hole, and you know, within a depth second, it's making all these 4D holes to 2 plus, 3 plus, and it just, just cascades down. It's an enormously complex system. And we haven't even talked about resonance, so what about resonance, right? So it turns out that, you know, the initial model was that, okay, you're, you're sort of in a saturation mode. You're going to ionize all the way up where you can do one photon ionization, then you're going to quit. And that's, a charge, that's your end charge state if you have enough fluids. But it turns out that when you take a look at these more complex atoms, that's not exactly what happened. So when at Argon, when you had 480 D, the sequential single photon limit was 10 plus, but they observed 13 plus. And in xenon, um, at 1500 D's, this, this limit was 27 plus, but 36 plus, right? That's a pretty big difference. But when they were at 2000 EV, everything worked properly. So kind of like, oh, that, that's really an odd thing. And this was um, uh, led by Artem Rudenko and uh, Daniel Wallace, and was published in uh, another bad journal. <laughs> but, but what it showed was that that, uh, that, that that simple X atom model actually did not work to predict what was going on. And the reason was they haven't really included resonances. And this is, this is, the, this is the computational model um, that is, uh, you know, is, is housed at, uh, at, uh, at CFIL. But, and, and it, as I told you, it's very, they use very, very simple um, um, calculations of all of these quantum mechanical you know, cross-sections and whatnot. And so what we thought is that it would be a nice contribution if we could actually take into account all those resonances. And so this is something that Faye Ho and our group did just, just recently. 
And it's a huge challenge because of the number of electronic configurations associated with you know, all possible bound bound transitions in the app. So here, for, for Argon, you know, it's, it's not so bad. Um, without these resident excitations, you know, the number of electronic configurations that you might want to consider is, is you know, manageable. And when you get up to Xenon, with these resident excitations, you're getting up to like um, a mole. <laughs> Uh, of electron configurations that you have to consider. And the maximum number of an unsigned 64-bit integer, they points out to me, is <laughs> less than that number. And so you can't just make a big table and then right. pick out what you need when, when you need it. And so you really had to have a really efficient database for storing and retrieving all this atomic data. Um, and you did that. And so then it turned out that we could predict not only what happened with the with the yeah, you know, anomalous uh, uh, things in Xenon, we could actually track what was going on in the argon. And so here, what you see is, you know, going out to this argon, you know, beyond 10 plus, you can see here is a particular pathway that goes, this purple photoionization, OJ, photoionization, OJ, so on and so forth. Out here, you have this one little channel that's a resonant excitation when you get way out into, um, you know, these higher charge states. It actually accounts for about 25% of the yield of this particular charge state. So what, what's, I'm, I'm sorry, what, what's on the vertical axis? What, what are you plotting? Well, th this is like um, population. Okay. Okay. So this starts out as one. And so when you get to one of these places, some of these, some of these stop, right? And so you, this is, the reason we have this is because I saw Pat Damer get, do a Sankey diagram of how energy goes in and how it's used. I said, oh, well, we can use that to display, you know, where all the population goes when you start with, you know, a neutral atom and where it ends up. And so some of this is ending up, you know, for example, argon 6 plus is red stuff, is, is some of it got stopped at that particular place. So if you add up all these bars, then you'll add up to one on the other end. So anyway, so it's very complex, but you can trace it all. We have a way to trace it all. So we figure, okay, now we know where all the electrons are, at least in this one atom, right? And so we figure, okay, well, this is a, a building block for all these other things that we want to do. So... Uh, two, uh, what kind of pulse do you use here? What kind of pulse do we use uh, here? Sculptural pulse or the, the real uh, sculptural Oh, it's, it's a Gaussian pulse. Usually it doesn't make so much difference for these things because, um, you know, each one of these states lives a long enough time that those little short spikes aren't, aren't, of, aren't of the same time scale. But okay, so that was good. And then, you know, we also wanted to investigate what, what would happen to some of the, these other situations. And so we made this complex landscape of resonances in these high phase pulses. This is an example of krypton. What you see if you, you pick a particular photon energy, say 2kb or so, what you do is you first, um, well, this is all of them together. But here, they're separated out into resonances for core to core, core to valence, and core to Rydberg. And if you pick 2kb, what you see is you first run into core to Rydberg, and then core to valence, and then core to core, and so on and so forth. So, and what you, what you know, you know, from this sort of thing, you can figure out where you can go to minimize damage by choosing your photon energy. And maybe you didn't really need this to do that, but okay. <laughs> so, so let me summarize what, what basically I said. Okay, so, you know, atomic interactions with intense x-rays, you know, optical strong field interaction is basically a single electron multi-photon interaction. And, and you know, you, you strip out one of these outer electrons. But, you know, for these ultra strong x-ray interactions, what's going on basically is you have many, many single electrons, single photon interactions that you know, are in a sort of complex system. And so this is, you know, the challenge is to be able to model, or I would say, to understand all that in this complex system for other applications. But, you know, it's central in these uh, XF world experiments with focused beams. It's predominantly sequential. But, you know, the sequential things display nonlinearity also, but it can be reasonably well modeled. Um, these photo absorption simulated emission rates can exceed the, the rates of these inner shell decay processes. Um, Multi-photon absorption in the X-ray regime is a little bit insensitive to the spiky structure of uh, the Sassiapia pulses. Everything is sort of a single, they're all single photon type processes basically. 
Um, but there are continuing challenges, which I'll tell you about tomorrow. But, you know, if you really want to go to these, you know, imaging things, you want to look at the molecules and bigger things. So in increasing complexity, and of course there are real challenges. In, you know, if you'd actually like to start to control intershell dynamics, you, you obviously need better, you know, X-ray lasers to do that than, than what I talked about now. But you know, those are interesting uh, continuing challenges. So I want to, you know, you're supposed to talk to us experimentalists. I want to show you a whole picture of all of us experimentalists uh, at Argonne. Um, this is a picture of the whole group. And I want to point out especially, this is Fei Ho who did all those calculations I sort of just showed you about. Um, this is Christoph Bosted who just joined our group from Slack to become a group leader. Uh, this is Steve Southworth who you know, was, was previously uh, a group leader there. And, um, and we had Gilles Denis who, who you heard some of, he was previously a, a nice postdoc with uh, Lou Moore who led you know, some of the uh, experiments there and Anne Marsh who's um, a, a really a new star to come. And maybe with that, <laughs> <laughs> so thank you for your time.
first part of uh, the uh, X-ray for electron waves, it produces one wavelength, and then they can like double it with, with the next part of the, uh, the FDL. So there's, there are lots of schemes <laughs> out there, and, and everybody's working in the same